guys and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to talk about the connectedness between SIBO and autoimmunity on a grand scale. And like our last video, we're going to talk about the connectedness between the two and try to answer the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Stay tuned to learn more. So first, a little primer. I'm going to put the umbrella term autoimmune disease or the autoimmune process on one side, SIBO on the other side, and we're going to draw some arrows and try to understand the connectedness. But first, I just want to give you a little bit of a primer of what is autoimmune disease, what is the process, and what kind of conditions are we actually talking about when we lump this all in under the same umbrella. So this is going to be conditions like Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, pernicious anemia, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, um, gosh, I mean, Crohn's, colitis, celiac disease, it just runs the gamut. There's so many to choose from. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, did I mention those two? I don't even know. There's a list of more than 100 autoimmune conditions that we are currently aware of, and there's more and more research every day that suggests that other conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome might actually be autoimmune, although they historically were not classified as such. So in this bubble of autoimmune disease or the autoimmune process, we are clumping 100 plus different diagnoses and conditions, but there's some stuff to know about autoimmunity that connects with SIBO, and I think it's worth your attention knowing how the two overlap and are connected. So side note too, I'm gonna to put a link in the description to Alison Seebecker's website. She has a really nice exhaustive list of a lot of research articles about SIBO with various conditions, and you can look up your specific condition potentially, or you could always hop on PubMed. But I'm going to start in on the conversation by just mentioning that autoimmune disease is inherently inflammatory. It's the immune system that is dysregulated or out of balance, and the immune system kind of has a whoopsie daisy, right? Like we would like to go around and not have our immune system attack our thyroid, but for people with Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, that is what happens. The immune system has a whoops. Similarly, we would like our immune system to attack viruses and bacteria, but not our joints. But for somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, the immune system has a bit of a whoopsie daisy. It thinks that part of the human body is an enemy when in actuality it's not. So it's kind of vaguely analogous to allergies in the sense that your immune system has deemed something a threat when it's not actually a threat. But knowing that autoimmune diseases are inherently inflammatory, the immune system is dysregulated or unbalanced, and that they are progressive, typically it's gonna get worse and worse and you're going to accumulate new autoimmune diagnoses as time goes on if you're not managing it appropriately. Those things are really important to understanding the link between autoimmunity and SIBO. And then one more thing to prime us on before we really get started is that the evaluation and testing for autoimmunity is enough to drive you stark raving mad. So if you wanted to test for Hashimoto's, you could run thyroglobulin antibodies and TPO antibodies. If you wanted to test for rheumatoid arthritis, you could test for CCP antibodies. But there is no single test that definitively will say, yes, you have autoimmune disease, now you just need to go find out what kind it is. Wouldn't that be great if we had a, a marker like that? Like just one tube of blood, yes or no, simple answer, but unfortunately, that's not the world we live in quite yet. It's more, you know, it more so what's going to happen in both a conventional setting and a holistic setting such as my own. We're going to talk about the likelihood of autoimmunity based on your symptoms and other diagnoses. Like if somebody comes in to work with me, for example, and they are hypothyroid, they have a family full of celiacs, they have a family full of type 1 diabetics, and they have symptoms of, you know, of joint pain and the hypothyroidism and constipation, I'm more likely to work that person up and test them for Hashimoto's and rheumatoid arthritis as opposed to somebody who comes in and they have diarrhea and tremors, right? So you just have to, the clinician has to go off of the symptoms and the other diagnoses and the family history to put a complete picture together and determine what tests make sense. Otherwise, you could be potentially trying to draw 100 different tubes of blood for 100 different tests for 100 different diseases. And that's not a very effective way or kind way to manage somebody's health because then you'd be anemic and you would collapse on the floor from the anemia. But 
just so you know, the testing for autoimmunity does get really squirrely really fast. So it's best to just go off of your symptoms, your family history, your other diagnoses, and then make that call on a case by case basis rather than trying to assess for every autoimmune disease on planet Earth. And now with that framework behind us, let's go ahead and talk about the connectedness between these two conditions. So like I said, autoimmunity is inherently inflammatory in nature. So the inflammation is going to do some damage in and of itself and make you more prone to SIBO. So for example, inflammation is gonna make it really hard to heal your gut lining. So welcome to the leaky gut that never ends. Autoimmunity and the inflammation that comes with it can dysregulate the nervous system and make it really hard for say the vagus nerve to work or for your motility to work. So I'll just put NS for nervous system here. As a consequence of that inflammation, we're gonna have a little bit of neuroinflammation and neurologic dysfunction. Then depending on the gland or the tissue that is affected, you might have direct consequences of that. And that is gonna depend on the diagnosis, but say, uh, well, let's take myself for example. So somebody with celiac disease like me is going to have more localized inflammation in the intestines, and then that can impair digestive juices, motility, gut healing lining, and somebody with autoimmunity is very likely to have dysbiosis, whether that is SIBO or not. That, we could probably even draw this as an arrow coming in from the side, bouncing off and then going to the SIBO land. But I would say dysbiosis is an independent risk factor outside of SIBO and it can go hand in hand with SIBO and both are worthy of our attention. Now, the SIBO and autoimmune connection, of course, is going to be similar to our last conversation about hypothyroidism. The main way that SIBO is going to lead to autoimmunity or exacerbate autoimmunity is via that inflammation. And similarly, you can have inflammation that particularly affects the nervous system. So this is gonna be far more detrimental to somebody with say uh, multiple sclerosis or a neurological impairment. You're gonna have some inflammation that in and of itself is going to affect the gland that is, or the tissue that's affected. So the joints in somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, the thyroid in somebody with Hashimoto's, whatever the case may be. Likewise, SIBO can cause nutritional deficiencies or malabsorption. So I'm just gonna write that as newt, deaf, but nutritional deficiencies, whether this be in something like iron or vitamin D or a B vitamin, iodine, whatever it might be, nutritional deficiencies can make the immune system function in a poor way or a dysregulated way. It can make it harder for tissues to heal and can ultimately contribute to that inflammation and that dysfunction that is a part of the autoimmune process. And then lastly, it is not uncommon for people with SIBO to have some degree of impairment in their juices, as I mentioned in the last video, but think about things like low stomach acid, low pancreatic enzyme output, poor bile flow. These are needed to sterilize and keep the house kept up well in the intestine and that that affects your ability to digest your food and absorb nutrients. It affects the way that you, you communicate with your microbes so that that inadequacy of digestive juices from the SIBO potentially can lead to more autoimmunity, more maldigestion, more malabsorption, and that can actually dovetail into the nutritional deficiency conversation. So there's a lot of connectedness between the two. I, I would say this, this is a little bit less clear than our previous video on hypothyroidism because that is a distinct entity, it's a distinct diagnosis code, and it's easier to do that research. I don't know if anybody has parsed out the exact statistics for autoimmunity broadly as opposed to SIBO, but what I will say is that if you have SIBO and you don't treat the SIBO, you're probably at a very, very low or zero likelihood that you're going to properly manage your autoimmune condition. Maybe it could happen. Maybe you do stuff for the dysbiosis that happens to be good for the SIBO and then you get benefit there. But 
broadly speaking, I would say if you do not treat the SIBO, your autoimmunity is probably not going to get profoundly better. On the converse side, I do think it's possible to treat the SIBO to some degree without managing the autoimmunity. It just really depends what the autoimmunity is and what tissue is affected. If you have more local GI autoimmunity like celiac disease, Crohn's, or colitis, you might really need to be aggressive with the anti-inflammatories and the management of the autoimmunity in order to treat the SIBO. If you have autoimmunity such as rheumatoid arthritis and it's not affecting thyroid hormone function, it's not affecting your sex hormone function, um, it's not directly impeding the nervous system, it's not directly impeding the gut, then there's some likelihood that you could successfully treat the SIBO without first getting the autoimmunity under control. So one direction, I would say you, you really need to treat the SIBO if you're gonna manage your autoimmunity. The other direction is a little bit less clear and I think it's going to be specific to the condition you have and where that autoimmunity is affecting you and then how that is going to affect the body. If you have autoimmunity that is affecting your thyroid and you don't have good thyroid hormone function, then that I think will keep you stuck in SIBO land. But if it's something that's a little bit less directly related, like say, you know, the skin or the joints, then there's a maybe that the two uh, can be treated a little bit more independently. But as always, you can see all the connectedness between the two and God bless them, the conventional medical world, just pretend that you can draw a line between the two and say, nope, you go to one doctor for the other, one doctor for the other one, you're good to go, whatever, goodbye. There's so many connections. I don't think that we could fully separate the two, but I know that it can be very daunting to think that you have to treat both conditions at the same time and people get really lost and doomed and, and not in a good place mentally with this. So for what it's worth, I think that one direction, very, very important to treat both. The other direction, maybe a little bit less so, depending on your diagnosis. As always, I would love to hear your stories. Have you been diagnosed with an autoimmune condition only to find out years later that you had SIBO? And did you think that one preceded the other? Do you have SIBO and you're wondering if you have autoimmunity and maybe that's like your missing link? And if so, have you had any sort of workup? And of course, always share, share ideas that you have in the comments. I would love to hear them. And for that matter, ideas for videos. I'm always looking for new ideas to get the mental juices flowing. And of course, I really hope that this video helped you understand the connectedness between your autoimmunity or lack thereof and your SIBO. And I hope that it leads to the most effective, perfect treatment plan possible for your body so that you can feel better and heal and stop watching YouTube videos like this. Guys, I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.